This morning, <laughs> we've been talking about uh, encounters, people who had face-to-face personal encounters with God. And I know all of us in here who are saved, we had an encounter with God. We had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. It might not have been personal. We might not have seen uh, a personage. We might not have heard a voice. But if you're saved, you've, you've had an encounter with God. The Holy Spirit's dwelling inside of you. But we're talking about people here who have had that face-to-face encounter. And the fellow I want to talk about today is a guy named Moses. And we've all heard of Moses. He's one of the patriarchs. Moses, uh, we all pretty much know the story, I think. He was uh, born in Egypt at a time when the children of Israel were enslaved. If you know the story from uh, Exodus, uh, the end of Genesis and Exodus, they came. Joseph uh, was the second in command in Egypt, and there's a whole long story behind that. But it was... uh, is that these, these, uh, uh, they, 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 were, they were enslaved after living there. And actually, it had been about 400 years from the time that the Israelites first came into Egypt until the time we read about, that we're going to read about in Exodus chapter 2. You know, 400 years, that's about how long this continent has been inhabited by Western Europeans. The early 1600s, they began landing on the shores of uh, what is today the United States. It's 400 years later. And, and just like, I, I believe, I draw some parallels, just like when the Jews, or when the Israelites first went to Egypt, they were welcome. The Pharaoh then just loved them, and he gave them the best place to live, and he just made them, he just uh, exalted them because they were Joseph's family. But after 400 years, they became like a curse to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians saw them as a threat, uh, and so they enslaved them. They, they took away their liberty. They said, what are these, what are these Israelites there? They're, uh, they're shepherds, and the, and the Egyptians hated shepherds for some reason. And, and, and they have the best land, the land of Goshen was some of the best land that, that you could get in all of Egypt. So they, they took them out of there, and they enslaved them. They made them slaves. They made them make bricks so they could build buildings and so forth. And uh, the, the Pharaoh at that time said, look, man, these, there's, too many, there's too many of these Israelites. So he said, any child that's born, if it's a male child, they're supposed to throw them in the Nile River. Uh, genocide. They're trying to wipe out the line. It was Satan trying to wipe out the line through whom the Messiah would come. And uh, the story of Moses goes, with, to read it, before we look at Moses, I want you to look at a New Testament passage, a couple New Testament passages. The first one we want to look at is Acts chapter 7. And, uh, <coughs> and, and, and starting at verse uh, uh, verse uh, 20. Uh, uh, this is, what we're reading here is the testimony of Stephen. He was the first martyr. He was brought before the Jewish leadership and they ended up getting killed. But he's, t- he's talking about Moses. And he says this uh, in verse 20. In the which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now listen, God knew who Moses was before he was born. God knew he had a purpose for this boy. Matter of fact, if you read it in Exodus, there was something special about Moses. There was something that the the parents, they looked at him and said, this is a goodly child. There was something about him. He had been chosen by God for a purpose to deliver his people out of bondage. So they, they recognized there was something special. When his mother put him in the uh, Nile River and put him, put him in a little basket, a little ark, they called it, and, they, and he sent him out in the river, the, the, the daughter of Pharaoh, the daughter of the most powerful person in the world at that time, saw him and her motherly instinct, and I believe the, 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 the uh, moving of God, caused her to take uh, that baby to herself. She recognized him as one of the Hebrews. She gave him back to his mother unknowingly to raise until he was old enough to enter into the palace. Now, reading here from what Stephen is saying, uh, it says, When he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. When Moses grew up, he, he went to the best the most uh, prestigious colleges and universities and schools that there was in Egypt. Because the Egyptians, they had a great amount of knowledge. They built pyramids, right? So they had a great amount of knowledge, and they, had, and they schooled him. Moses was, was taught, and he grew up, and he became powerful. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And it says, And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brother and the children of Israel. He knew he was a Hebrew. He knew he was a child of Israel. 
And he, he decided that he wanted to go visit his brethren. Now listen, anybody here ever see the movie Ten Commandments? Ever with Charlton Heston? Forget it, okay? Forget, forget all that stuff, all right? Now, it's, it's just, okay. <laughs> Don't get your theology from Hollywood. I, just, I always say that, okay? Now, so when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, uh, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. If you read over in Exodus, you see there was an Egyptian taskmaster who was being cruel to one of, one of the Hebrews. So Moses killed him, right? Killed him and he, and he buried him in a shallow grave in the sand, okay? And, and the thing is, we're going to find out that when Moses did that, he was, he was doing it by faith. Because he knew, just like everybody else knew, Moses felt and sensed the presence that, that God had a purpose in his life. And he probably figured, hey, now I'm going to read a little bit into it, please, so understand this. He probably figured, hey, uh, man, here I am. I'm a Hebrew. I'm, I'm the daughter of, uh, I'm the son of the most uh, important woman, the daughter of Pharaoh, right? I've, I've got power. I've got learning. I'll be able to do something for my people because I've got the position. I've got the power. I got the, you know, I got City Hall. Man, I'm in City Hall. I can do something for you, right? So he figured he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna accomplish this thing, this, this God-felt purpose in his heart to deliver his people Israel. So he, he figured he's going to do it one at a time. So he, he saw this, this Egyptian taskmaster beating one. He just said, I'll take care of him. Take him out. Bury him. And he probably figured, hey, man, I'm doing God a favor. I'm, I'm on my way. See, so like, what? You know, how are we going to solve the problems in our city? Well, let's go around and do citizens' arrests. So let's go around and we'll get somebody elected in the, in the city hall. We'll get, we'll, get folks, we'll get folks in positions of power, right? The thing is, Moses understood that he was, he was appointed, but he wasn't yet anointed. <laughs> it wasn't his time. And that wasn't God's way. God had another way. Reading on what Stephen was saying, and he's explaining, he's, he's expounding upon Exodus chapter 2 for us. He says, in verse 24, Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. He figured if, if the Hebrews saw that he was like doing this for them, they would say, hey Moses, go, yay Moses. But that's not what happened. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one against uh, uh, another, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he that uh, did his neighbor wrong thrust them away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Will you kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Uh oh. <laughs> Moses was discovered. So what did he do? He took off. He tried to do what God, he thought he was doing what God told him to do. But it didn't quite work that way. He did it in his own strength, his own power. He did it because of his position. In the, you, you know what? Human government will never bring about God's purpose. It will never bring about God's purpose. It can't. As a matter of fact, human government, really in its rawest form, is diametrically opposed to the purpose of God. You can be a citizen of the United States, but if you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven... Those are two kingdoms that are opposed to each other. I don't care what the founding fathers wanted. We always talk about Christian nation. Listen, human government, whether it's in the United States or in Russia or in England, human government will always deteriorate to antichrist. It will always deteriorate to antichrist. So you can't bring about God's purpose through faith-based initiatives that got strings attached to them. You all know what I mean? Okay? So now... Now, look, we're going to look one more place in the, in the New Testament, and we're going to go to the Old Testament to read the story. Over there in Hebrews, okay, over there in Hebrews, chapter 11. That's a, that's a faith chapter. You all know where that is? Uh, uh, I think I know where it is. There it is, okay. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, check it out. It says this, starting in verse 24. <laughs> by faith, Moses, by faith. Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He identified with his people, with his family. He identified with them and would rather have been called a Hebrew than Pharaoh's daughter. And he acted on that, even though it was in his own strength. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin 
for a, se- a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ better riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Why, why do we see stuff going on in, in our neighborhood? Man, four or five shootings in the last couple months just within several blocks of this place. Why? Because they're not esteeming the reproach of Christ better than the, the reward they get from the world. Okay? It's, it's easy. It, it's better, it looks better to them to walk around with a big wad of money in their pocket than to walk around with a tract in their hand. So they want to drive an Escalade. So they're willing to sell death and spread death so they can have the big car. That's, that's the kind of that's, you know, survival of the fittest situation that we're living in right now. And what's happening is Moses, he could have bought into that. And he could have done it with the idea that he wants to help his people. But he said, I don't want that. So instead, he esteemed the reproach of Christ. It says, verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. We know what happened when uh, Moses killed that, killed that Egyptian, and he got found out. What did he do? He took off. Went into a place called Midian, the backside of the desert. I don't know how many preachers ever preached a message called the backside of the desert. It's a good, good name. He went. He left. He left his people. He left his position. And he went to a place where he was a stranger in a strange land. Met a fellow there, married his daughter, and was keeping sheep for another 40 years. Now with that, I want you to turn with me back to the book of Exodus, all the way in the Old Testament. Okay? And we're going we're to be there. And we want to look at verse, uh, chapter 3. Okay? Well, no, let's back up. Uh, And verse, look at verse, chapter 2, verse 23, and we'll go into chapter 3, all right? <laughs> I don't know if I got that up there, guys. Okay, chap, uh, verse 23. And it came to pass in process of time. Now, now, when Moses killed the Egyptian, he was like 40 years old. This is 40 years later. He's 80 years old now, okay? And he's out tending sheep. He didn't start his Social Security yet, right? He was, he was still working, right? And it came to pass in process of time that the king died... And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. God's people were crying out. I want to tell you something. At this time, the the children of Israel were not a nation. They weren't a nation. They were a family, the children of Israel. But they weren't a nation yet. They cried out to God, and God heard and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. It's been 400 years. God never forgot. But the time was right. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Okay? When you cry out to God, God hears you. Okay? Now, now look at, look at chapter 3. Here we go. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. It's the same as Sinai, Mount Sinai, okay? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Here we go, face to face. Moses spent 40 years out there in the desert, away from his people, thinking that he had maybe missed his calling. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe he felt like he was going to be the deliverer of his people, but maybe he missed God. Have you ever felt like that? Well, God, I thought you put me here, but I'm not so sure. Because when things don't quite work out the way we think they ought to work out, we start to question our own calling and start questioning what God has told us, right? And sometimes we might even question God's word, God forbid. But listen, Moses was out there in the middle of nowhere, and he sees this bush burning up, but the bush isn't being consumed. Fire. Glory. He came in, he came in contact, face to face. When people come in contact with a living God, there's some, there's some kind of manifestation. There's something there that he shows them who he is. You get touched with the Holy Spirit. God will let you know who you are. When he knocks you over and lets you see yourself in the light of his gospel, and you find out, oh, man, I, Lord, I, you know, it's like Isaiah said, whoa, woe unto me, I'm a sinner. I, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in the people of unclean lips. When you come in contact with God, you ain't going to walk away smiling necessarily. Because you're going to find out how unholy you really are. It really happens when he does it with church folk. <laughs> okay. It's 
quiet in here today. It's all right. All right. Listen. It says, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'm going to check this out. I'm going to see what this great sight, why this bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw, he turned aside to see. God called him out of the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, don't come here. Put off your shoes uh, from off your feet, because this place whereon you stand is holy ground. Moreover, I am the God of thy father. Man, listen, this is a face-to-face now. I'm the God of thy father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, he was actually looking upon his face, but this was an encounter, a one-on-one encounter, like Paul had on the road to Damascus, we talked about, like Gideon had, you know, while he was hiding in the wine press, while Jacob had when he was wrestling with God. And the Lord said, I've seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. 400 years. I've seen, and he had been seeing all them 400 years. I've seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Man, God knows. Don't think God doesn't know what you're going through. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. I'm not going to leave them there. I'm not going to allow Egypt to help them do what I want them to do. I'm bringing them out. In fact, we read, find out when God wanted to bring them out, God wanted to form a nation. He wanted the nation of Israel. Right now he had the sons of Israel. That was fine. But he wanted to bring them out and make them a nation. They weren't a nation yet. Just like our nation became a nation when they wrote the De- Declaration of Independence. Right? And then, and then they, they made the Bill of Rights, you know, which is you know, our Constitution. That, that's what defines us as a nation. Well, what God wanted to do was he wanted to give them something that's going to define them as a nation. It's called the law, the Ten Commandments, the, the covenant of the law. That's what would make them a nation, relate God's, uh, God's nation. He says, verse 11, now, now, now remember, I say this, whenever folks meet God, whenever folks meet God, a couple things happen. Number one, God usually tells them to go someplace they don't want to go. Remember that? God usually tells them something uh, to do that they don't really want to do or that they don't think they can do. And then God equips them supernaturally, right? So listen. V- verse 10. Come now, therefore, Moses, and I will send you unto Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. God, what'd you say? He said, who am I? That I should go. Pharaoh was the most powerful person in the world, and here is Moses, a fugitive, out in the middle of the desert somewhere, taking care of some sheep in a foreign land, a stranger in a strange land. He says, who am I? If, if God would have said that to him 40 years ago, he thought he was somebody, but now God got him to a place where he doesn't think he's anybody. Sometimes God got to get us someplace where we don't think we're nothing. Sometimes when we think we're so talented and so powerful, man, I got all the gifts. I can do whatever. Oh, God, I can serve you. Sometimes God got to get you to a place where you feel so helpless and hopeless that you got nothing. Then he can use you. Because when you realize you got nothing of your own, then God says, okay, now I can do it through you. He says, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, certainly, I will be with thee. Who are we to bring change in our city? We're nobody. I don't have any power down City Hall. You got power down City Hall? We got like a lot of money. We're going to build a big uh, recreation center. We'll we'll whatever. We'll do the stuff the world does to kind of get people together and and make them all feel good and and all that. No, is that, that, can we do? We can't do that. What are we going to do? Maybe depend on God, huh? You just imagine that. We're running out of options. No longer is this nation friendly toward Christianity. There's hostility toward uh, the preaching of the gospel. 
that says right is right and wrong is wrong and sin is sin. There's hostility toward that. Now we've got to be all inclusive. We've got to be tolerant. We've got to be all this stuff. Well, you know, how, how are we going to do this if everybody's against us? Well, praise the Lord. Because the more they're against us, the more God is for us. He says, this shall be a token unto you that I have sent you. That, uh, 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 that I have sent thee. When you have brought forth the people of Egypt, you shall... Serve God on this mountain. He says, you're going to come back here, and this is where he's going to give the law, okay? And Moses said unto God, and see, Moses getting all these reasons why he's not the guy. I can't do this. He says, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to him, what is his name? What am I going to say? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. I am. Jesus quoted this in John chapter 8. He said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> Just, I am. I'm the I am. That we, that's what you'll say to the children. I am has sent me unto you. And God said, moreover, Moses, thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and all these other rites. And they shall hearken to your voice, and, and you shall come, uh, you and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and you shall say, The Lord God of the Hebrews has said, Met with us, and now let us go. Can, well, well, let's go up to Pharaoh and say, I've just talked with God, and he said, let us go. I'm sure he'll say, yeah, sure, Moses, take them. Take our workforce. Take the people we're dependent on to make bricks so we can build our buildings. Take them. Yeah, sure, right? Yeah, right. Well, we'll go out into the streets and tell everybody about Jesus, and they'll just love us and put their hands together and say, oh, I want to be saved. Right? right? Anybody here ever do any street witnessing? Oh, is, is, it, is it everybody? Everybody says, oh, thank you. Yes, yes, I want to be saved, right? Not if you tell them the truth. If you start telling them the truth, they might want to slap you. They might want, might want to hit you. Say nasty things to you. Because sometimes the truth hurts. I don't like to hear the truth. I hate it when people start witnessing to me before I was saved. Because they tell me stuff I don't want to hear. So I said, you're going to go, you're going to, go to Pharaoh? And you're going to say, let my people go. And God says, and I am sure, in verse 19, that the king of Egypt will not let you. It won't work. <laughs> you know. God says, I want you to go do this, but it won't work. Well, hey, God, <laughs> can you give me something that will work? <laughs> and I'll stretch out my hand. See, see sometimes, and I've, I've told this story before. One time when I was just young in the ministry, right, Pastor Spencer, I, I had a chance to go visit somebody in the hospital. Somebody called and said, hey, will you go visit my uncle or whoever it was? He's in the hospital, and he's dying, and he's not saved. So I went to visit this guy, and I said, I, you know, I told him the gospel. And I was just like kind of new in the Lord, you know, I was, I was, I was you know, in the ministry. So I went, and I had been with Pastor Spencer before. Some of you might not remember my Pastor Spencer, who was, who was a dear friend. And, and I would go with him in the hospital. One time I went with him, and there was a guy laying there, and he, he preached to him. And this guy gave his heart to the Lord, man. It was, oh, great. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go to this hospital. I'm going to preach. I'm going I'm to talk to this guy and pray with him, and he's going to accept Jesus. I'll say, oh, hallelujah, right? So I went and talked to this guy. I gave him the gospel. I gave him everything. And I said, would you, would you like to be saved? He said, no. I said, I said, uh, I said well, no, I mean, would you, like to, would you like to receive Christ? He said, no. I said, so I said, okay. So I left. And I was like, hey, God, <laughs> did I say something wrong? You know, maybe I got, maybe I had to get, maybe I had that thing wrong. I don't know. But, you know, and so I called Pastor Spencer crying to him, you know, hey, Pastor Spencer. And he said, sometimes it's for judgment. Sometimes, they, if when you go, they're not going to be able to say, well, I never heard that. They're not going to be able to stand in front of God and say, I never heard that gospel. Moses was going there for judgment. Because the leadership of Egypt had gone so far away, they had got so wicked and so, uh, so uh, ungodly and so antichrist that Moses was going to, to pronounce, he's pronouncing judgment on them. Satan's heart was hardened. He says, I'm sure the king of Egypt won't let you go. 
And I'll stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people uh, favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass when you go, you shall not go empty. In other words, not only are you going to leave, but they're going to give you stuff to get you out. And we know that's what happened, all right? Now look at chapter 4. And, and this is just a few more things. We're closing. We're closing. Chapter 4 and verse 1. And Moses answered and said, but look, they won't believe me. You ever tell yourself that? Somebody says, hey, let's go out. Let's go street witnessing, right? I know, folks, if you know anybody that's really in the street witnessing, they're like crazy. They don't care. They, they say, let's go out, man. We'll go down to like the worst part of town, right? And we'll go talk to folks and tell them about Jesus. I say, well, they won't believe me. Will they believe me? Sometimes I stand up here, I wonder, do people believe what I'm saying? Because <laughs> sometimes you wonder how folks act if they believe what you're, what you're telling them. Okay. Moses answered and said, Behold, they won't believe me. They won't listen to me. For they will say, God didn't send you. And the Lord said unto him, What's in your hand? And he, and he said, A rod. He had a, he had a rod in his hand, just like... I won't walk over here again. But, you know, he has stick in his hands. That's what they would use for, for shepherds. You know, they would use a stick. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a snake, a serpent. And Moses fled before it. I would, too, because I don't like snakes. <laughs> and if I, if I, if I took that stick right there and threw it on the ground and became a snake, man, you'd see me out that door faster than you could blink. God will take whatever you have and he'll use it for his glory if you'll let him. Whatever talent you have, whatever you got, it doesn't have to look, it look important, it doesn't have to look big time, but whatever you got, God will use it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth your hand and take it by the tail. And he did, and it became a rod. God's saying, look, look what, look what I'm, I'm going to give you power for this. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put it into his bosom, and he took it back out, and it became leprous, right? I mean, God's showing Moses a few things. And he put it back in, and it, and it came back out, and it wasn't leprous anymore. So the next thing he says, look, look at verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, I can't talk. I mean, Moses, he's trying everything he can to get out of doing this. I mean, he's bringing up every kind of excuse. They won't believe me. Uh, I can't do this. I'm afraid of Pharaoh. I can't talk. I stutter. I'm not uh, eloquent and everything. He says, uh, he says uh, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither there, therefore, heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who made your mouth? Or who makes the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? God says, listen, I'll give you every word you need to say. Now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, oh my Lord, send I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. He's saying, send somebody else. And God started getting a little ticked off with Moses. <laughs> God finally says, all right, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll let your brother Aaron... He can talk. I'll hook you up with him. And the story goes that Moses went back to Egypt, met up with Aaron, and all these things happened. You can read about it, and we're not going to go through the whole story because it's long. But the, you know, he went to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no, get out of here. And matter of fact, the first time Moses said, let my people go, Pharaoh got mad. He gave them more work to do. And they weren't too happy about that. So we know the story, the, 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 the death angel came, Passover, Moses kept the Passover, took him through the Red Sea, right? And he took him up to Sinai, up to Mount Sinai, where he saw the burning bush, his first encounter with God. I want to show you his next encounter with God, and we're going to close. Turn over to Exodus chapter 33. Now, to fill in the blanks here, this is about two months later after they left, after the Red Sea, right? 
And Moses went up to the mountain, and God gave him the Ten Commandments. And you know the story? He came down, and the people were what? They had built the golden calf, right? And Moses broke the Ten Commandments. And God got ready to wipe the whole bunch out, and Moses interceded. Okay, so, so Moses went back up. The Lord said to Moses, this is the same place where he saw the burning bush. He said, depart and go up there, and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land of, I swear unto Isaac, unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee. He's saying, listen, I'll, I'll send an angel to go before you when you go into the promised land here. And, and Moses said, no, no, we need you. I don't need a, I don't need a subservient. I don't need second. I want God leading me, Okay. And down in, down in verse 8. And it came to pass when Moses went out of the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door. And it came to pass as Moses entered the tabernacle. And so if we're dropping down a little bit, I just, I just, I just, want, I just want to show you. Uh, in verse 12 of chapter 33. Moses said unto the Lord, You say unto me, Bring up this people when you have not let me know who you will send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in your sight, show me the way that I may know thee, that I may find grace. He says, I want to see you. And he goes on later, and he says, listen, here's what Moses says. We're just going to encapsulate this, and we're going to close. Moses said, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. How many people want to see God's glory? I want to see God's glory. He already met him in the burning bush, the fire, you know, glory, we think of fire. The second time, and you can read about it, Moses went up, God said, this time, you know, the first time God got the stones, this time he told Moses to get two stones and write on them. The first time God wrote with his finger, you remember? And God says, listen, Moses, you can't look at me directly in the face. Because I'm God, you can't take that. So what I'm going to do, Moses, I'm going to find you a, a place in a rock. I'm going to hide you in there, and I'm going to let you see just a glimpse. I'm going to let you see the, the, the hind parts of my glory. I'm, I'm going to let you see who I am. And Moses saw that. And after he saw that, you know what happened with Moses? He began to glow. So much so that when he came down off the mountain, the people were afraid of him. Because he was so filled with, with God, he had seen his glory face to face. Man, this was a face to face encounter. And they could tell just by looking at him. I want to ask you this morning, and we're going to close in prayer. How many of you want to see the glory of God? We need the glory. Listen, I'll tell you what. In this time we're living in, in this place we're living in, we need to see God's glory. Amen. We hear about it. Have somebody else talk about all the great things God has done. I need, we need to see God's glory. We need to see him move. In this building, outside this building, in our families, in our homes. With these, these kids need to see God move. Amen. Some of us old folks need to see God move again. Amen. Ain't seen him move in a while. Like we're used to. I'm not talking about warm, fuzzy feeling. I'm talking about seeing some. I'm seeing some things go on. Lord, we. But here's the thing. There's a price for that. You want to see God's glory? Moses saw God's glory. And you know what he had to do? He had to walk around with a veil over him like this. Because he's shown. He glowed, and the people were afraid to look at him. They couldn't get near him. So when he was talking to the people, he had to go like this. But when he was talking to God inside the tabernacle, man, he was a face to face. The glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God. I want an encounter with God. Do you want an encounter with God? You can hear about him all you want to. You can hear about him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, some channel, somewhere. Somebody be talking about them. You find out all about them. Their folks know all about you. They'll tell you everything about everything about God. They, they, they know them, but you know what? I want God to know me. I'm not just satisfied having information about Jesus Christ. I want to have a relationship with him. 
I want to not only talk to him, we spend all our time yap, 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 talking to God, but I want to listen to him. I want to hear him. I want to hear what he has to say. I want to hear his voice. I want to hear his command. And there have been times God has said stuff to me, and I've said, oh, God, I can't do that. Not me. Go find somebody. I don't want to go there. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to her. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't want to forgive him. Anybody ever been there? I ain't forgiving him. I'm not going to let her go. I'm not going to give up this grudge. I deserve it, right? If we want to see the glory of God, we need to put it all on the altar. We need to get empty just like Moses. Moses thought he had it all together. He thought he had the power. He had the position. He's going to take care of his people. It didn't work. He had to get the power where he would say, water turned to blood. He had to get the power where he would say, the death angel's coming. Put the blood on the doorpost. Keep the Passover. The blood of Jesus. That's what we need. That's the only thing that's going to save us. That's the only thing that's going to bring life to our community. That's the only thing that's going to bring life to your family, in your household. That's the only thing that's going to bring life to your kids. That's the only thing that's going to bring life to these kids, to every one of us in here who are sitting here half dead. Because we do the religious thing, we go to church, but the rest of the week, it's like Jesus is just somebody in a book. I want to have a relationship with him. Just like Moses. Moses talked with Jesus every day. That's what it said. He had an audience with, 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 with the Lord every day. I want to have an audience with him every day. Every day. Because that's when I see his power begin to move, brother. See, I can't do it myself. I can't heal anybody. I can't save anybody. I can't save the neighborhood. I can't, save, I can't go out here and, and save drug dealers and crackheads. I can't, I can't do it. But God can do anything. Amen. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. God can do anything. He can, he can save your wayward son. He can save your wayward daughter. He can save Valley High School. Amen. Believe it or not. <laughs> He says, you going to Butler High School? Let me read, you going to Butler High School? He can save Butler High School, too. He can use you, he can use you to do it. La Marie says, not me, but you. God can save that family. God can save that husband or wife. God can bring healing. We just need to start believing that he's able. And we need to start believing that he's not only able, but he'll do whatever we allow him to do. When we find ourselves empty... He'll fill us up. That's why Moses had to run. He had to run. I pray, God, we need deliverance. I can't deliver nobody, but God can do anything. God can do anything. Thank the Lord. All right. I want to pray. Let's just pray. Why don't you stand with me as we pray? And, and you know... Uh, There's a, song, there's a song that we sing. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace. Thou art welcome in this place. You know, to put a, to put a, a little postscript on Moses. He led them people through the wilderness 40 years. It would have only been two years, except the people refused to believe God. But you know, Moses never entered into the promised land, at least in the flesh. Because he had disobeyed God one time in the wilderness. He didn't get a chance to go over Jordan. But you know, he did go to the promised land. You know, when, when, when they were up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus and his disciples, and God appeared, the Shekinah glory of God came down. Guess who was there? Moses. He made it into the promised land. <laughs> Actually, by, the time, by that time, he, he didn't want to stay. He was, he was up with the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now. 
that as we prepare to go out into this world out here, we prepare to walk out that door, that mission field that's right on the other side of that door, Father, in these streets up, up and down here in New Ken with all the stuff that's going on, Father, all the, all the, all the evil and the wickedness and all the, all the, all the covetousness and, and uh, the, 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 the drug culture, the thug culture that's in this town. Father, I pray, God, it might seem scary, but we don't got to be afraid because you promised us, Lord, that you would cover us, that you would, we put on the armor of God right now in the name of Jesus. The Father, yes, we're going to get opposition. Yes, the world is ugly. It's getting uglier and uglier every day. But Lord, we're standing on your word. You've given us a mission. You've given us a commission. You've given us a purpose to be alive if we're believers. We have, we have, we might not be called to save a nation. We might not be called to lead a, a, a million people out of Egypt. But we might be called for like a, those one or two people that's next door. Or those people across the street. Or the kids that's walking up and down here uh, living like thugs. Father, we might be called to them to let them know the truth. That the, the, the path they're on is only going to lead them to either death or jail. Father, I pray you would bring deliverance in our neighborhood. Use us to do it. Use the churches in this neighborhood to do it. Not just this one. There's a lot of good churches in this neighborhood. You, Father, you would light up the pastors, the, the, men of, the men of these churches, Father. I'm calling on the men in the name of Jesus. Because we're the ones that need to go out and take authority in Jesus Christ's name. Father, I pray, God, you would use us. The men that meet here on Monday night. And the men that meet in other churches in this city, Father. That you would raise up men to go forth uh, like Moses, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That we might preach your word, somebody might hear and get saved. Father, it might be that one that might pull the trigger next year. If they hear, they, if they hear your word, they might get saved. They might, they might step out of that lifestyle, Father. Lives are at stake. Eternities are at stake. Father, help us. We can come up with every reason why it shouldn't be us. But Lord, there's one reason why it should be us. It's because you've called us. If you call us, you're going to equip us. You're going to send us someplace we don't want to go. Tell us to do things we ain't really anxious to do. But Father, we pray, Lord, you'll help us be obedient to your calling. We're going to dismiss this morning. After we dismiss, if you would like prayer, maybe you just got something you want to lay on the altar. Maybe you got some kind of resentment or hatred or something you want to get rid of because as long as you hold on to that stuff, it'll never work. We're going to dismiss, and if you've got to leave, you can go. But myself and Brother Jairus, Brother Joe is here. Brother Leo, we'd love to pray with you.